So today we're going to continue in this, uh, uh, in Genesis. And last week, uh, Rob uh, shared about uh, Jacob. He's the guy we're following right now. Jacob went away and uh, met his uncle and met his uncle's daughter, I guess that's his cousin, uh, and he was enamored with her and he worked seven years and then he uh, got fooled and so he ended up with two wives, Leah and Rachel, and that's where we left off the story. And, um, and it's, it says in, in verse 29, 17, and what Rob talked about last week, that um, it compares the two girls, the two young ladies. And it's, uh, it, it says, the name of the older was Leah, the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. We're not sure what that eyes were weak mean. I read several commentaries, etc., and it's, there was some element there that caused her to be less attractive, naturally. And, her, and the contrast with her sister Rachel, her younger sister Rachel, was that she was lovely in form and appearance. And so there's definitely a, a contrast there. These sisters aren't the same. They're different. And then it says in, at the end of that uh, passage from last week, it said, speaking of Jacob, he loved Rachel more than Leah. So often we hear this story. I think in the past I read this story and I thought about Jacob getting tricked. And I thought, oh, poor Jacob, he got tricked. He thought he was marrying Rachel and he got Leah. And as I've read this repeatedly these last several weeks, I think my perspective has changed. And my perspective has changed from, oh, poor Jacob, to, oh, poor Leah. Poor Leah. And we're going to talk about these two sisters, and particularly Leah today, and see what we might uh, learn from this rather... Uh, I don't know. It's a complicated story. It's a complicated account, and which we'll see as we go into it. And it says, Leah, she was not only loved less, but it said, hated. Compared to her sister, she was much less. So let's pray and commit this time to God's leading as we hear uh, uh, these words. Father, thank you for this time that we have to look at the word you've given us, the the account that you've provided that uh, tells about these people, these real people that went through this and help us to understand better what this means in the big story that this, uh, this book gives us. So help us to listen, help us to hear, and help us to uh, understand more and be encouraged by what uh, you did through Leah and uh, through these people we read about. So commit it to you. In your name, Jesus, we pray, amen. So I'm going to just uh, highlight through this story. Uh, We're going to start in uh, chapter 29, verse 31, and go through chapter 30, 24, and uh, just hit some of the high points, just to get the idea of this very, uh, I guess I'll just say very mixed up family situation. This is not a marriage seminar uh, this morning. (laughs) Let's make that clear. Uh, Jacob's family, as they grew, was uh, uh, anything but ideal. So it says, "When, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Okay, there's a lot in that sentence. 
So God saw Leah that she was unloved, that she was hated by her husband. And, and he opened her womb. He allowed her to bear children, but not Rachel. Not Rachel. So God saw her circumstance and blessed her. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then it goes on, <clears throat> and it says, he, she conceived and bore a son. And it goes on, and she bore four sons. She had Reuben. And she had Simeon, and she had Levi. And then she had Judah. Four, four sons. And all of this childbearing takes place over about a period of about uh, 13 years. Okay? Uh, he, he had worked for Laban for seven years, married these gals, and then he was there another 13 years with Laban. Uh, and so then Rachel sees that her sister Leah is having all these sons, and she's not, and she's desperate. And so then she does what Sarah did with Abraham, gave, her, her, gave him her handmaiden. So Leah says... I mean, I'm sorry. Rachel says, Jacob, take Bilhah, my handmaiden, and can have children for me. And so then she has two. And then Leah ceased having children, so she did the same thing. She gave Jacob her maidservant, and she had two boys. And then through a trade some mandrakes, Leah conceived and had two more boys. And then finally, finally, Rachel had Joseph. Rachel uh, conceived and had Joseph. So, so there were all together uh, 10, 11, okay, bunch of boys. And so, Leah, let's, let's go through this a little bit. Leah was put in an awful, awful position. Her father gave her under deception to a man who was madly in love with her prettier, younger sister. That is not a great situation for anybody. She was in a bad situation. And, and Jacob didn't love her. He loved Rachel. And she was powerless to change her situation. She was stuck. She couldn't just say, forget this. She didn't have that option. She was given. And she was powerless to change her circumstance. But it's, it's encouraging to see in, in this messy situation that God had compassion on Leah and gave her the ability to bear children. But she longed for love. Leah longed to be loved by her husband. She longed for that validation. She longed to be valued. She longed for significance. You can see, as she bore these first four sons, if you look at their names, first one was Reuben. Reuben, which means see, a son. And it says, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, my misery, for now my husband will love me. So she named him See, look. And she thought, now I've, bo I've born Jacob a son. And now, he's, now he'll love me. But then she had Simeon. Simeon means heard, or one who hears. And, and, and Leah said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated. This is her second son now. So it, it, she didn't get loved after the first one. Because I'm hated... 
He's given me this son also. And then she had Levi. Levi means attached. Attached. She said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. You can just see the desperation for the love of her husband, for the affection, for the, for the attachment. He'll be attached to me. I've given him three sons. But it didn't, didn't pan out. Then she had Judah. Now Judah... His fourth son. And there's a bit of a change in her perspective here, a bit of her change in her response. She's, Judah means praise. And she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So on some level, Leah had a change of heart, change of perspective that she wasn't looking only to her husband for that affection, only to her husband for that validation, for that significance, for that honor. But she said, this time... This time I'll praise God, Yahweh. I'll praise him for giving me this son. So on some level, Leah had a, a bit of a change of heart, change of perspective, some, in, some encouragement. But I think as we go on, we'll see that it was at best short-lived. At best short-lived. You know, the childbearing in the Old Testament times was huge. It was, it, uh, uh, it was a significant part of a, of a woman's, a wife's role is to bear children. Is to bear children. It's, it's how a woman distinguished herself, how she, she was honored. And part of it was because, as, as you read, it, it was God who opens and closes the womb, who gives the ability to have children. And it and they believed that, knew that, and so that if a woman was able to conceive, she was honored by God. She was, had God's favor. And if she was unable to have children, they called her barren, and that was a reproach. That was a disgrace. That was a disgrace. There, there are several accounts of barren women in the Old Testament in the New Testament, one of them is, is Hannah, the, the mother of, of uh, Samuel. And in 1 Samuel 1, it talks about her desire to have children. She, she was unable, and she was greatly distressed. In fact, she was, at some point after years of being unable to have a child, she was at the temple praying and pleading with God, and she was so immersed in that plea that the priest thought he, she, was in, she was drunk. She, he reproved her for being in the temple drunk. But she said, no, I'm just begging God for children that her reproach would be removed. And Rachel, later in the, in the passage we're looking at today, when she finally conceives and has, has Joseph, she says, finally my reproach is removed. Her disgrace is removed. So childbearing was just such a significant thing in a way that a wife would gain significance and purpose and honor. And for these two sisters, for these two sisters in this really awful situation, childbearing became a desperate competition. It became a desperate competition so after her first four sons, it's, it's Leah four, Rachel zero. And then Rachel, through her handmaid, had two. She considered those her children. She said she's had children. See, I have a son. After her handmaiden gave birth to her first son, she, Rachel said, now I have a son. It was a desperate competition Rachel said at one point here in, uh, in the beginning of chapter 30, she says to, to Jacob, give me children or I, I'm going to die. She was desperate. Give me children or I'm going to die. And I think it's the, the desperate competition is evidenced by their, both of their willingness to give their husband another woman. 
I mean, that, that's just not what we would consider a, a good arrangement, right? But they were desperate for children. They were willing to go to that length. So this was a competition. Rachel said at one point, after she, her handmaid gave birth, she said, I've wrestled greatly with my sister and I've prevailed. She saw it as a, re- it was a competition. It was a, it was a all out. So first it was Leah four, Rachel zero. And when all was said and done, it was, if you count their, the f- two extras, it was Leah eight and Rachel three. It was a competition. And yet they were neither ever satisfied. They were never satisfied. They never said, ah, we've made it. I've made it. I, I'm, I'm, I've reached the point where I feel satisfied. I'm fulfilled. I have the honor that I desire. My husband is attached to me. There, there's, we're in a good place. That never, never appear, appears to happen here. They desire to be fulfilled, validated, even to justify their existence even. Leah's situation never became what she desperately desired it would be. Never. In fact, in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 30, uh, Leah gives birth to her sixth son, Zebulun. Zebulun means honor. And she said, now my husband will honor me because I've given him six sons. She, she was still longing for his, his honor, longing for the, the attention, the attachment of her husband. You know, oftentimes we seek significance. Oh, I'm sorry. Rachel also, I just wanted to mention, Rachel was not satisfied either. She was never content. She finally had Joseph, right? Her first son. And it says, she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. So it was, good, I've got a son. Can I have another? Neither of these women were satisfied. And so often we seek, we seek significance, we seek satisfaction, we seek meaning in life. And oftentimes we fall short, we just don't get what we hope to get. We take things like relationships or family, a successful career, good things, Good things, accomplishments, even possessions, a big bank account. We, we think those are the things that will satisfy us, that will fulfill us, that will give us significance, that will give us a, a sense of value, that I'm worth. We take these good things and we make them the thing. We make them the thing that's going to make our existence worthwhile. It's going to make our life mean something. In the, in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, you know, Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, one of my favorite books. Uh, he wrote Ecclesiastes, and he, he was wise, he was rich, he was smart. He had all the pleasures that a person can pursue, and he kind of went on an experiment to figure out what would satisfy him. He built things. He enjoyed all the pleasures that, uh, physical pleasures that life could provide. He was wise. He understood things. He really went after it, every which way. And he said his final conclusion was it's all just grabbing after wind. We've had plenty of wind around here lately, just try, he just grabbing wind. You can't grab the wind. It just goes through his hands, and, and, and Solomon knew that. And I think oftentimes we don't want to admit it, but 
But things that we grasp for, things that we hope are going to give us significance and value, don't. They don't. They leave us wanting. They leave us searching. Feel like we're chasing the wind. I think, why is that? I, I, I know I've experienced that where you, you think you're, you, you think about something that you, you'd really like to accomplish or, or something you'd really like to possess or a job you'd really like to have. You think, boy, if, if I had that job or if I had that car or if I had that vacation, boy, would I be happy. Boy, would I be happy. And it, it you get it? Eh, yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty soon, it just, it's a car just getting you around, you know? And I, I found, I, 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 I've talked about that phenomenon before, but there's a name for it, I guess. It's called uh, hedonic a- adaptation. Hedonic adaptation. And basically that means that when, we, when something good happens, when we accomplish something good, it changes our happiness briefly. And then we tend to, this is we people, like all of us. And then we we'll quickly go back to baseline. You quickly go back to baseline. You quickly go back to how happy were you were last week. In fact, they've, you know, they, people that win the lottery, you know, you hear people say, boy, if I won the lottery, whoo, I would be happy, you know? What's that, what's that T-shirt that says, uh, you know, they say money doesn't make you happy, but I'm willing to give it a try? Um, yeah. Anyway, they've studied lottery winners, and you think, boy, if anybody would be happy, somebody win $5 million, you know? Even lottery winners, after an initial rush of excitement and happiness, they go back to the same as last week. It's true. It's true. We, we are searching for things to make us significant, and we don't find them. In this, in this story, these two sisters were doing that. They were desiring fulfillment through bearing children, through the affection of their husband, and they weren't satisfied. And so there's, there's really no happy ending. You read this account, there's no resolution. They don't eventually come to some understanding. They don't, you know, Jacob doesn't say, oh, I love you both. Or there's no, You get to the end, there's no happy ending. And we oftentimes think of Bible stories as they should be complete in themselves. You know, the Sunday school story, you know, has a beginning and an end, and there's a, there's a lesson to be learned. There's no one in this story uh, that to be emulated. Oh, be like that. Don't be like that. I mean, maybe there's some don't be like that's, but, but there's not a, it doesn't get tied up with a string. No happy ending. So I, what, what we've been looking at in Genesis is that this is a story. It's an unfolding story of God's relationship with us, with his people. And so this story, I believe, is part of that unfolding larger story. And how does this fit in? Well, one of the, one of the things that are signif- that's significant about this account, and particularly about Leah, Leah was given greater honor than she ever dreamed. God granted her an honor that she had no comprehension of. Through her descendants came the Messiah. Rob mentioned earlier during the music that this story is one that back Abraham was given a promise that his descendants would would bless all the families in the earth through the Messiah. It's through Leah that that Messiah comes. It's through Leah. Not Rachel, not the pretty one, not the loved one, but through Leah. Jesus was that Messiah. 
And Jesus is the perfect husband. Leah didn't have a perfect husband. Neither did Rachel. Jesus, the Messiah, is the perfect husband. God used the picture. Rob mentioned in, the, in music this morning that God uses pictures to describe his relationship with us. We sang about he is our shepherd. He also uses the picture of a husband. I, I don't easily think of myself as, as a bride. Uh, I was a husband once. Um, I mean, I am a husband. <laughs> now. I, I, I was a groom once. I, that's what I meant to say. And I'm, and I'm still a husband. Uh, but, so I, I don't... But reading this passage and, and some of these passages I'm about to share have given me a better uh, understanding of what it means when it says that the church, us, we're the bride of Christ. He's our husband. He's our husband. In Isaiah 54, there's a passage and in, in, in it's God talking to his people, Israel, and they were estranged from him. And it says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit. Leah, you could say, she was emotionally deserted. And I'm sure she's grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast off. He says... He's our husband, our maker. He's our redeemer. Think of that redeemer idea. That sounds, it's kind of a church word, right? Redeemer. We don't think about re- that a lot, but redeem is to gain back or win back or, or pay a ransom for, to restore something, to regain possession or re- uh, rescue from harm or distress. A redeemer redeems a situation. You know, it means to put things right. And in the, it's the same term here in Isaiah, the, that redeemer, that our maker is our redeemer. Same word as in the book of Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. Some of you are familiar with that story of Ruth. She had a kinsman redeemer. Ruth was a, was a Moabite. She wasn't even an Israelite. She came back with her mother-in-law. Long story short, they'd gone to Moab, Naomi and her husband and two sons. Husband, two sons marry. All the men die. Naomi and her, and her widowed daughter-in-law come back. They're both widows. They're destitute. They don't have resources. Ruth is gleaning. She is redeemed by their kinsman redeemer, Boaz. She's redeemed. She's rescued from her hopeless situation. She's rescued from that hopeless situation. And like Leah, she was un- Leah was unable to rescue herself from her situation. She couldn't rescue herself. And Boaz, that kinsman redeemer, he was the picture of Jesus, who is our kinsman redeemer. And Boaz was a descendant of Leah's son Judah. Judah, that fourth son, he was the one that was the line of the Messiah, the line of Jesus. And Boaz was in that line. And Ruth, the Moabite, was in that same line. And like Leah, we're, we're helpless to redeem ourselves. We're hopeless without God in the world. In Ephesians 2.12, it says, we have no hope without God in the world. That's the position we were in before Jesus redeemed us, before our kinsman redeemer redeemed us. Now there's another passage in, in, in Isaiah I want to take a peek at. Again, this is God talking to his people. In verse four it says, but you shall be called, my delight is in her. Can't you imagine that that's just what Leah wanted to know? that Jacob delighted in her. She longed for that. My delight is in her. And then going down, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. 
That's what Leah desired, wasn't it? To be rejoiced over, to be appreciated, not just for bearing sons, but be appreciated for who she is. That he would be delighted. And that's what God is toward us as our Redeemer. He's delighted in us. This is... This is talking to his people as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride. The excitement of a groom at his wedding. That's what God is toward us. So shall your God rejoice over you. You'll be called, he delights in her. God is delighted in us. The very thing that Leah longed for, to be loved and delighted, God has toward us. Ephesians 5, I don't know if I have this. Ephesians 5 verse there. I don't know if I have this up here. So, so he might present the church. He's talking about um, Jesus in the church, Jesus being redeemer of the church. It says that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. That's us. That's what Jesus accomplished. He made us Holy without a blemish, perfect. Knowing that our satisfaction, value, worth, fulfillment comes from God because we are bought with a price. In Him, Ephesians 1, 7, that I think I've got up here. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished. He's redeemed us with a price. Jesus' blood, he reached down and made things right, redeemed us. So it's interesting, look, thinking about, I've kind of ventured a little ways off of, uh, of, of Genesis here, but thinking about the, the story of Leah and Rachel, it wasn't the good-looking sister that God honored. It wasn't the one that seemed to have it all going for her. It was God loved the unloved. He cared for the unwanted. And I, there's a little book by Tim Keller called Counterfeit Gods, and there's a passage in here I, I just want to read because he says it so much better than I can. And, and it's talking about Leah and her role and how God blessed her and what that, what that means. So just read this. This child was Judah. So he's talking about Leah's fourth son, Judah. This child was Judah. And in Genesis 49, we are told that it is through him that the true king, the Messiah, will someday come. God had come to the girl that nobody wanted, the unloved, and made her the ancestral mother of Jesus. Salvation came into the world not through beautiful Rachel, but through the unwanted one, the unloved one, Does God just like to root for underdogs? No, this wonderful gift to Leah meant far more than that. The text says that when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he loved her. God was saying, I'm the real bridegroom. I'm the husband of the fatherless. I am the father of the fatherless. This is the God who saves by grace. The gods of moralistic religions favor the successful and the overachievers. They are the ones who climb the moral ladder up to heaven. But the God of the Bible is the one who comes down into this world to accomplish the salvation and give us a grace we could never attain ourselves. He loves the unwanted, the weak, and unloved. He comes down. It's not that we're able to accomplish something that will impress him. It's not that we're able to prove ourselves but that he, God, came down to the unloved, to the unwanted. He saves by grace, not those who deserve it, not those who are good-looking enough or smart enough or rich enough. So what is, what is our response to that? What is our response What do I do with that? Where do I tend to put my confidence? 
for my value, my significance. I thought about this, I thought, oh, you know, it's, it's easy to tell ourselves, oh no, not me, I, I don't do that, but I, truth be told, I, I, was, I think I trust or put my confidence in competence. I'm able to do things, I'm able to accomplish things, I'm able to, you know, get it done. I'm able to come and go physically. And that's where, that's what makes me significant. That's what makes me worthy. And I, I know that if, unless I come to a tragic end, I will not always be competent in many ways. We tend to, as life goes on, we lose abilities. We may not, that competence is temporary. I may lose the ability to understand and be understood, or the ability to do certain things. So where's my confidence? And I think I'm reminded of, of psalms that I go back to that remind me that my hope needs to be in God. My hope needs to be with Him. One of my uh, go-to passages is in Psalm 16. Verse 5 and 6 says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. The Lord is my chosen portion. He's, the, he's what I'm hanging on to. He's what I'm going for. Or Psalm 73, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Easy to say, but is that really my heart? That nothing else will satisfy. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I, I read those verses and I say, yeah, yeah. I, but then when, when my competence is tested or, or my abilities are threatened or my possessions are threatened, do I panic a little bit? You know, when things don't go quite so well and I, my foundation feels a little shaky, am I really trusting God? I, I have opportunity to not look to my own ability, not look to my own ability to be worthy, but to trust that God is the one that redeems. I can practice that now. When I sense that I'm leaning too much on my own, I can repent of that and remind myself and be reminded by others that my significance, my security, my safety is dependent on God. Leah's significance wasn't evident to Jacob, wasn't evident to Rachel. Leah's significance was evidence to God in his unfolding plan. He took Rachel, the unwanted, the unloved one, and brought about the one who would bring salvation to the world, Jesus. And that's the message of hope from this rather hopeless story. But that God is our redeemer. God brought a redeemer through Rachel. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this unfolding story. Thank you that you promised to Abraham that you would bring through his people one that would redeem us that would be our kinsman redeemer, that would reach down in, in our hopeless situation and make it right, put it to right. And like Leah, we don't have all that it takes. We don't have any that it takes. We need you. We thank you for this message of hope. Help us to remember that you, you are the one that holds us. You're the one that provides. You're the one that makes me valuable. I can create my own value. I can try to be something. But you're the one that makes us something. That makes us worthy. You have, uh, you delight in us. Help us believe that more and more and more this week. Every day. Be reminded that you delight in us and you have uh, redeemed us. Jesus, by your, by your very 
body and blood. So thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.